Hi, everyone. Good. My God, my night class, my walk in, they're just dead. They're just tired. I guess you're still talking, so you're happy. You guys all right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right. What's going on? Anything fun going on? Anyone do anything interesting? We all turned in our breaks. Was that today? Yes. Congratulations. Is that the last writing assignment for the year? Yes. Wow. So, okay. So, just so I know, am I your first exam? Yes. Yes. Oh, God. Well, I guess, is that good or bad? Good. Uh, terrible. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, because actually yours, I think my uh, property one is like when the first days. Our property is all the way at the end. Um, let's see. Actually, in case anyone's interested, yesterday I was in Austin um, at the Texas Supreme Court, that investiture of two new justices. Uh, uh, Justice uh, Heck was elevated to Chief Justice, and Justice Jeff Brown, who was formerly at the Court of Appeals in Houston, was also a Justice. It was very cool. And uh, Justice Scalia presided over the uh, ceremony, which, which was kind of kind of nice. Uh, everyone, everyone's been to the Capitol, right? Anyone not been to the Capitol? You, you should go while you're here. It's actually really surprisingly cool. I'm, I'm not big on architecture, but I really like how it looks. Uh, and, and I enjoyed it very much. It is. It's really nice at night. And the cool part was during the investiture, it was actually in the House chamber. So they actually let us sit in the seats where the members sit, which was kind of cool. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's going on? Any, any questions, comments, anything going on? Okay. Everyone knows there's no class on Thursday, right? Everyone knows that? Okay. So you're off. Uh, and uh, so there's nothing there to worry about. Uh, everyone knows about the uh, exam review session, whatever it is, that, that, that Friday, next Friday, right? That was the 20, 22nd, right? Everyone knows about it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, the 22nd, right? Everyone knows about that? Okay, 9 a.m. Yes, sir. So how it's going to work is this. You're going to come in. I'm going to have one question printed out for you. It's going to be on paper. You can type up in your computer. I don't really care. You can do it by hand, whatever you want. That will be 90 minutes. You have 90 minutes to do that. After 90 minutes, we'll come, and I'm going to go over it in really significant detail. And I'll use the A-plus answer from last semester as a model. Um, so that will be a very good um, guide. Uh, a, a couple ge general thoughts. Um, a couple of you have asked about the word limit. It's not as bad as you think, but the word limit is 500 per question. Okay. There's usually going to be five or six subparts for each question. I try to limit it to that. So that's give or take 100 words per subpart. And they're usually going to be pretty much equal. So that's the way to budget it. I don't want you to waste time reciting the facts to me. I don't want you to waste time reciting rules of law to me. I want to see your analysis. Okay? If you look at the A-plus answer from last, you'll get a sense of what that is. If you start trying to give me facts and other things, you're just going to waste, waste your time. Um, I, I was a law student not too long ago, and I know that in a given three-hour exam with a, with a computer, I can spit out thousands of words, and I can give, tell you everything I conceivably know. I don't want you doing that, because that doesn't show me anything. What I want to see is you actually know the answer to my question. Uh, when you get the paper, take a lot of time to read it through, because it's not very hard to write 500 words. It won't take you very much time, but you need to really think the question through, because this can be tough. Um, it's going to be a very complicated question with a lot of things going on, and there are multiple right answers, and you're going to have to make a judgment call what you think might be the best answer. Okay? Let's see. Uh, I'm sorry? Didn't I tell you? Yeah, I thought I told you. Uh, I think it's... I have it here. One second. I'm sorry. I thought I told you. Uh, 518. Is this 518? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it'll be right here. Okay. Sorry, I thought I told you. My mistake. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed, like, over your previous exam, you tested, like, saying sex marriages. We didn't really talk about that. So was that on the syllabus for this year? Well, it was a little bit. We didn't talk about it. So it won't be on the test. Don't worry about it. She, yeah, I talked about it last year a lot more, but this year not so much. Okay. If it's not if it's not in the syllabus, it's not in the exam. If we didn't talk about it in class, it's not. I mean, I, uh, the, the way I write the exam is very simple. I go through my lecture notes page by page, and I pull through, oh, that looks interesting, that looks interesting. So if I didn't mention in class, and, you know, it's not in the book, it won't be on the exam. Okay? It's, I, I'm, straight, I'm not going to give you something you've never seen before. You'll, everything you'll see before won't be any surprises. 
Okay. Uh, any other questions we did last time? Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right, let's move on. So we previously did leaseholds, and we talked a lot about what happens if the landlord messes up, right? We did one case where the landlord fails to get rid of the previous tenant. Or we did another case where the landlord prematurely terminates a lease. And what are the measures of damages? We talked about the various leases. You have the periodic tenancy. Uh, you have the term of years. We have all these different types. Today, we're going to be talking about something that's very modern, inherently modern, really the last 50 years or so. These are rights given to tenants. Okay? At common law, the entire landlord-tenant relationship was basically skewed in favor of the landlord. There was no doubts about that. The tenant was basically there at the terms of the lease at the grace of the landlord. The landlord had a lot more authority to do whatever they wish. But modern law doesn't take such a, such a narrow view. Modern law does this by giving the tenant rights. That's why the entire uh, relationship is defined this way. So one of the bigger overarching issues that you'll see in property law, this semester kind of, but next semester a lot, is merging of contract doctrine with property doctrine. And you all took contracts, right? You all taking contracts. Contracts is very much into fairness and equity and doing the right thing. So does everyone remember contracts and we call the duty to mitigate? Remember what that is? Basically, if you have a contract and then there's going to be some sort of a breach, that the party can maybe, you know, say there's a contract for widgets and one of the party breaches, if the party who didn't breach can maybe sell to someone else, he has the obligation to do so to minimize damages. The reason why we have this is to make sure that resources aren't wasted. It's not a very good idea to have someone sue for damages when those widgets are perfectly fine to be transferred. We also have these kind of duties of consideration uh, and other types of fairness and justice and estoppel and all these other things. These doctrines were all created in contracts, really in the 20th century, to kind of make contracts more fair and to kind of balance out the bargaining power. So you always have you know, the big company, right, and you have the individual guy. And we, we said that the individual person has an unequal bargaining power. So these laws step to try to make it fair. Property, though, as I'm sure you're aware from this semester, is not contracts. The entire discipline we study with all these states, present interest, future interest, I said over and over again, this is not contract, this is property. I think several times people even asked me, what a, a contract doctrine that doesn't apply here? As a result, property is very, very harsh. We have these conveyances that if a condition is not adhered to, to the exact letter of the law, you might lose your property or it might be transferred to someone else, some sort of shifting interest. So property law developed in the exact opposite way. It's a very strict, harsh doctrine. It's fair in like the, you know, Renaissance era sense. Oh, did anyone go to the Renaissance Festival? Did anyone go? Wow. Have you, has anyone ever been there before? It's out by um, Conroe? It's pretty cool. I, I was... I mean, does anyone dress up? Are you dressing up? I, I didn't dress up. I actually, I actually felt like the weird one, which was kind of odd. It's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it, it was pretty cool. That, like, jousting, I liked it. Last weekend. Of course I got a turkey leg. Yeah. No, I don't need an alligator. <laughs> anyway, anyway. But... Property is like fair in the Renaissance sense, right? Uh, uh, that's, what, that's what triggered the thought. It's fair in that sense, but modern contract law is not. So what courts have actually started doing, and you'll see it in the cases today, is they've taken doctrines from contract law and they've read them into property, but in a very narrow sense. They've done it in the area of property law that most resembles contract law, which is the lease, right? The lease superficially resembles the contract. The lease and the contract you have two parties signing it. Now, you might remember last when you say the UCC, you might recall that it only applies to what? Goods and services, right? I hope your contract professor said this does not apply to property. Okay. Well, courts have basically ignored that, and they brought in UCC and contract doctrine straight into property law. So what this ends up doing is giving all these additional rights to the tenants that they did not have at common law. So everything we're talking about now did not exist at common law. I mean, this class, the next class, and the class after that, this is all modern 20th century stuff. Nothing's at common law, okay? And for today's class, we're going to be dealing with the tenant who defaults. Okay, and this default can take a couple different uh, manifestations. One, the tenant can 
stop paying rent. Two, the tenant can perhaps break a term of the lease. Maybe he can use the property in a, in a bad manner. He can make renovations he's not supposed to, right? Or, or maybe three, the tenant just surrenders and leaves and doesn't actually live there, okay? In each of these three cases, at common law, the tenant will have been screwed. The tenant will have been law. If he, want, if he stays in the apartment, or actually, let's start going around. Do uh, you remember where I finished last time? Them? Uh, you. Did I do you? Okay, uh, all right, Adam, you're up. Did I? Okay, okay. All right, Adam, and I'll go this way. Okay, so Adam. Now this is. What's up? All right, here's what's up. So at common law. In common law, say you had a tenant who stopped paying his rent. What would the landlord be able to do at common law if the, if the tenant stopped paying his rent? Well, would he be able to eject him? Yeah. How would he do? How would he do so? He could use the uh, concept of self-help. Good. What's self-help? Self-help is to actually physically, without like the police or anything like that, to actually remove all the belongings. And exactly. Stuff. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So at common law, you do self-help. It, it's exactly what it sounds like. You're helping, your, helping yourself, right? You don't go to the courts. You don't call the sheriff. You don't file any papers in court. You go there. You take his crap. You throw it in the street. And you change the locks, right? This is you helping yourself. Uh, let's see. Actually, was there any kind of um, requirement that you give any notice before you do this or any kind of uh, hearing? I mean, what, what did the landlord owe the tenant in that common law? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah, no, I, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas, yes. Sorry. It's a long snake. So, I, I'm sorry, at common law, was there anything that the landlord owed the tenant? Did he have to give any notice? Did he have to have any hearings? Did he need to go to court? Or could he just toss them on the street? So he could just toss them on the street, right? What happens if there was a dispute? What if maybe uh, the tenant had actually paid, but, you know, got lost in the mail, and there was just some sort of simple misunderstanding? Could the, could the landlord still toss them out? And would there be any kind of review of that? Okay. So it's a really harsh doctrine, right? The idea that self-help, you might think, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? If someone doesn't pay the rent, toss them out. Well, if any of you had a landlord, you probably had disagreements with him before, right? You might have thought something was one way. He might have thought something was the other way. But under the doctrine of self-help, the landlord is a sole judge, jury, and executioner. He makes all the decisions by himself, okay? And the same applies not just for paying rent, Say your uh, lease says you're not allowed to make any renovations, all right? And say you do something minor. Say, like, you paint the wall or something. And the landlord goes, whoops, you, you change it. You made a renovation, you're out. Your family's out, your furniture's out, your livelihood's out. And that's a really big deal, okay? Let me ask another question. So, Elizabeth, at common law, what would have happened if, a uh, say, a one-year lease was signed, right? And after one month, the tenant moves out and says, I'm gone, I'm leaving. Would the uh, landlord have any duty to maybe rent out the apartment for the other 11 months of that lease? Why not? That's right. So at common law, you have a one-year lease. Tenant moves out after month one. As far as the landlord's concerned, he can let the apartment sit empty for 11 months. Let's sit empty for 11 months. That's a waste, right? That's an absolute waste. So first, the apartment's not being used, and we like the property to be used. But also... Uh, let's see, Samin, is there any guarantee that the person who left the apartment will ever pay up? Who is in a better position to pay rent for those 11 months? Yeah, a new tenant, exactly. I mean, it would make sense that you'd rather have a new tenant who's guaranteed to pay this monthly, or at least, you know, pretty sure to pay it, than the guy who randomly left. Presumably he left because he couldn't pay. So this is really kicking someone while they're down, right? They left, but they couldn't pay for it. But there's a certain unfairness to this. Um, Sarah, how could how is it possible that the tenant messing up, right? The tenant defaulting imposes a new burden on the landlord. How is that fair? So, well, you know, why why would this why would changing the common law be unfair to the landlord? Yeah, why, why would imposing these duties be unfair to the landlord? Well, then, I guess because they have to communicate their social... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
Can you give me an example of why it would be a, a big burden on the landlord to have to try and mitigate? Why is that such a big deal? Yeah, I mean, has anyone ever, ever tried renting an apartment? It's not always easy, right? It's often a lot of work. Um, say you don't live in a particular place, you might have to hire an agent to go rent it out for you. <laughs> These duties impose costs on the landlord, right? And these costs don't come out of nowhere. Uh, one thing, and if you learn nothing else from me, just keep this in the back of your mind always. Whenever you add some sort of consumer protection law, any kind, it raises the cost of the good. I don't care what the law is. When you make it harder to evict someone, the landlords aren't stupid. They will factor that into their rent somehow. They will raise rent for everyone. Um, this is a variable. When you make it, when you make it in New York, for example, uh, in the book, where it takes you know six months to evict someone, right? When a landlord sets his rents, he's going to factor this and say, wait a minute, this guy defaults. I might have to live with him for six months without any rent. I'm going to maybe make the rent higher to compensate for it. You can't help people without raising costs for people, right? You can't make uh, housing more available without raising the cost of housing. It's this perverse cycle where efforts to help, usually by either legislature or by judicial decree, will invariably hurt people in certain respects. And we'll talk about a couple other, couple other examples. But I'm not saying this is a bad thing, though, because self-help can be very, very dangerous. Um, uh, Cameron, what's what's really the, the biggest problems with self-help? Why why is it something that society should should not tolerate? Uh, there's a breach in the peace. Yeah. And there's the post-war issue. Hmm? Yeah, and it can be violent, right? You can imagine. I mean, has anyone ever had a landlord come into their apartment when they weren't supposed to? You ever? Yes. Want to tell us about it? No. <laughs> Want to tell us about it? Okay, All right. okay. I, I think that's, that speaks for itself, right? When a landlord comes into your apartment when they're not supposed to, that's a really big deal. That's, that's, that's coming into your home, your privacy, your, your castle, right? Your, your, your manor. We don't like that. It's a very big intrusion. And often, and I'm not going to ask you or you, but the landlord might be, have been wrong about coming to your apartment? Yes. Okay. But who's going to resolve that? Okay. That's why the courts have inserted themselves into this process. Because the courts and the legislature said, we don't trust these landlords to be fair, right? Their interest is not in uh, uh, deciding these property disputes in, a, in, a, in an impartial manner. Their interest, I'm not going to ask either of you, is to make money and do various things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, you're an apology at all, right? Yes. So, we're allowed to come to a So, by living in a dorm, you consent to a lot of crap. <laughs> by living in a dormitory, you consent to a lot of stuff. So, you're consenting to an RA to come in? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure if you read your resident life agreement, there are a lot of things you consented to, especially if searches for drugs and alcohol and things like that. that you, you, you waive that. Uh, uh, and actually, an interesting issue. Anyone see this about at Gonzaga? At Gonzaga, a good property issue. So in the state of Washington, you're allowed to own a firearm, right? You can own a gun. But in the Gonzaga dorms, you're not. Okay. Well, this guy had a firearm in an off-campus housing at, at Gonzaga, but it was affiliated with the university. Someone broke into his apartment and tried to kill him. He used a gun in self-defense, and he, he killed the other guy. Now the, now the school wants to expel him for having a gun in his dorm. So I, I guess this would rather he, he would have died um, uh, than keeping a gun. But this was always a big issue in states that allow people to have firearms, even in school dorms, you're not allowed to. It's always a big issue. They don't ever actually lived in an apartment that said you couldn't own a firearm. They don't ever seen that. Those, Texas. Not, no, not, not in Texas, but you can be sure that there are places outside of Texas that have those agreements. Oh, and totally cool, but while in Austin, has everyone been following the 3D printing discussion? Everyone know what this is? I was there, yeah. So, uh, here, I'll show, you, I'll show you a picture of it. Uh, so, 3D printing is actually very cool. So, imagine you take a block of plastic, right? And you have this very fine laser. And the laser can actually cut grooves of the plastic to make three-dimensional shapes, okay? Now, imagine you do that with metal. You take this very fine metal powder and you lay on a very thin layer, and you have a laser actually cutting it and welding to the layer below. And by doing this in many iterations, you can actually make objects. And I was at, I was at, a, uh, I was at a facility yesterday in Austin. They're doing this legally, not, not like a crazy guy. They actually manufacture a fully functional 1911 pistol 
totally at 3D printing. I mean, even the, 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 the riflings, the inside the barrel, were within the CAD. Uh, it's stunning. It'll give you a sense of how it works. This is like the plastic frame. So they first made the plastic frame out of plastic, and they can turn it into a, uh, turn it into a whatever. And they, oh, this is the range. This is the groupings. But um, this stuff is remarkable. This is going to change the way we manufacture goods. Um, in a serious implication for uh, uh, intellectual property, because now instead of perhaps you know buying a pair of sneakers at the store, you can print your own, right? Or now instead of buying an iPad, you can print your own. Um, this is this is going to be really cool stuff. Um, if anyone can read up on it, I encourage you to do so. But back to property. Uh, we don't like self-help because people can get hurt. There can be disputes where the landlord's in the wrong. So that's why the courts have interjected themselves to kind of create these fair processes, to create fair ways of adjudicating these issues to make sure that the tenant has the right to be heard. Okay? This does create costs to the system. It does burden people, right? And I always ask this question. I know I shouldn't. Um, has anyone been involved in, a, in an eviction proceeding? And if you have, you only raise your hand. But I, I'm pretty sure that there are. Last year, I, I, had, I had a couple who actually did raise their hand. You don't have to. But this does affect people, and often eviction proceedings are, are done in a fashion that the tenant did nothing wrong, and the landlord might just try to get rid of them. And these uh, procedures exist to stop it. Okay. So then you also have kind of the egregious cases where a tenant really did mess up and probably does deserve to be evicted, or a tenant really messed up and she does deserve to have to pay back rent. Those cases are the egregious ones, but mm -hmm. the most part. Things go along smoothly. So let's do the case from uh, Minnesota, uh, the Berg. Excuse me, the Berg case. Okay, Kristen, you're off. Tell us what happened in this in the, the Berg case from Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So Berg signs a lease for to run a restaurant, and it's supposed to be a five-year lease. Okay, she agreed that she'd bear all the cost of the repairs. She said that she would also operate it in a lawful manner. That is, she would not violate the law. It's an interesting question because usually it's up to the state to administer whether you're acting lawfully, not a landlord. So just think about that of how a landlord deciding to operate in a lawful manner. Usually that's the state who decides it. But also, they said any kind of st structural changes, renovations have to be made by the uh, at the commission, but that commission cannot be unreasonably withheld. Okay, so there were a couple conditions. All right, all right, and then uh, Christina, what what happened? How did this uh, how did this uh, uh, family affair go awry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it got crazy. So th this is why self-help is not usually a good thing. So uh, she made some renovations to the property, and she changed some stuff around without permission. And Wiley accused her of breaching the lease. And also he accused her of uh, operating with unclean condition. So he demanded all these changes have to be made within this two-week uh, period, okay? Now, here the facts get a little bit fuzzy, right? Um, John, is, is it clear that the restaurant owner had any intent on complying with these requests? How so? Right, and what would you do after that? Okay, well, so at the end of this two-week period, right, she put a sign in her window that said, close remodeling. What else did she do at the end of that two-week period? What did she do for employees? Dismiss them, right? So think about this. The, the boss says you have two weeks to get your stuff together, right? During that two weeks, did you take any steps, John, to fix stuff? Did you find a contract or anything? Okay. What did she do? She ran her business for two more weeks, tried to get whatever money she could. At the end of the Friday, she put a sign on her door saying close remodeling. Everyone's ever seen that when places are going to business, they have a like, close renovation sign? Yeah. This is common. When a restaurant's going out of business, they put a renovation sign, so we don't think it's gone. So she was, she was going to follow, follow her employees. 
Andrew Cabal. Okay. But uh, uh, Travis, does the mere act of her putting that sign up and firing her employees signify that she's abandoning the property? Why not? Yes, right? So under the common law, right, if the landlord determined that she had abandoned the premises, he could kick her out, right? But here she's saying, listen, yeah, maybe I breached a term of the lease, but that doesn't mean I've abandoned it yet. I'm still here. And then, then as Christina mentioned, it, it gets kind of funky. Uh, uh, there's, there's this one period where she's in the restaurant, he's like kind of hanging on the awning, like Spider-Man's in the looking at her. It's kind of, kind of creepy, actually. I think there's some weird stuff going on with that. He goes back. Then he tries changing the locks. They call the sheriff. The sheriff says, all right, everyone, just stay calm. Let's deal with this on Monday. Um, then on Monday, he the landlord enters again. He changes the locks. And he changed the locks on uh, uh, July of 1973, right? The lease wasn't supposed to end until 75, so there were almost two full years left in the lease. Um, Catherine, what an interesting point. When did she lease the property out again? I'm sorry, when did the landlord lease the property out again? Yeah, so think about that. She, they changed the locks on July 16th, and they leased it out again on August 1st. Catherine, what do you think was going on here? What, what do you make of the fact that he leased it out again within two weeks of kicking the other one out? Do you think that, ten, that ten, new tenant was in the waiting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened here was the landlord probably had a new tenant waiting to move in. And that's why he was so freaking creepy about like hanging up the awning and changing the lock because he wanted someone else to come in. Right? This is a reason why we can't let landlords make all the decisions. You know, maybe she made renovations without permission, maybe not. It's an open question. But he was so intent on getting her out and new and in, right, that he didn't care. Not even the fact that there were still two years left on the lease. That didn't matter to the landlord. Okay? So the land was relet on, on 73. So, uh, David, how much unpaid rent then could the landlord reasonably collect if the, if the premise was relet like two weeks later? This is the end of the. Right, so is there really any gripe for the landlord part? So who sues here? Yeah, yeah, and what does the tenant sue for? Uh, I don't think they want to continue. What, 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 are their, what, are their, what are their measure of damages? What are they seeking? Yeah. Yeah, Matt, you can finish. Yeah, okay, so she brings a couple of of that. She's in for lost profits, right? The business was shut down for almost two years as a result of this, presumably. I mean, we all know her business was shut down anyway, but she can still pretend that she was going to reopen it. Uh, damage to chattels, I think they, they damaged a the piece of property in a restaurant. Uh, and a wrongful eviction. And that's really the main one we care about, the wrongful eviction, right? Uh, the landlord says, no, she abandoned it, and she surrendered it. Uh, let's see. How does the jury rule for in the uh, trial court, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. They actually ruled in favor of the uh, tenant. They said, yes, you were wrongfully evicted, right? Locking out was not a lawful way of kicking you out. It wasn't peaceable. Yeah. But then there were two issues on appeal. Okay, so, Gloria, first, did she abandon or surrender the premise? What the court said. Why not? Ladder, please. But she left. Isn't that enough? She put the sign saying close renovation. Why isn't that enough to have surrendering? Yeah, I mean, there wasn't enough evidence in the record to show if she actually intended to leave. I, I think that's right. There wasn't enough evidence to show if she leave, so they affirmed the jury's verdict. Okay? But the trickier issue has to do with the self-help. Christian, how did the court approach the, uh, the steps taken by the landlord to the ground? 
Okay. Pretty much, yeah. So, what are some of the reasons why they said self help doesn't work here? Yes, you. Right. Why? Why is it important that judicial process here? Mm -hmm. Mike, who, it, if there's just going to be a dispute between the landlord and the tenant, right, is there any opportunity for them to have a fair, balanced discussion with this one? What do you think? Do you think the landlord can ever give a fair shake in this situation if he's the, if he's assigned the issue? I don't think so. Outside of court. So what role would the court play then in this case? Yeah. So the courts are important here because they're a neutral arbitrator, right? They don't have a dog on either side. They're going to approach this case fairly and openly. So the court says, listen, the modern trend is that we have to have courts being involved in these disputes. Because maybe there was a breach of the lease. Maybe there wasn't. We don't know. It's going to be up to a court to decide, right? And then, Brandon, what does the court say about uh, people taking the law into their own hands? Well, how, why is that a bad thing? Violence, yeah. Do we like violence? What's that? <laughs> well, actually, MMA is a good example because it consented to, right? Both parties consent to getting the crap beat out of each other, right? I mean, you say that in torts, right? Boxing is, is legal. It's not a tort to batter someone in the ring because you both consent, right? Here, people haven't consented to violence. In fact, I think the court says in this case, it's thankful that the tenant wasn't violent, because you can imagine the landlord's coming and hanging like Spider-Man looking at them. They probably start beating each other up. Right? This is Texas. I'm sure someone will take out a, a 1911 and start, and start firing away. You don't, you, don't, you don't do stuff like that. Right? So we don't like self-help. We don't like violence. Okay? So, Alex, what about concerns, though, that it's going to take way too long to evict someone that, you know, this, this dispute happens on the 15th of, of July, and they want a new tent move in August. What does the law provide to allow this to resolve somewhat expeditiously? Yeah, what's, what's that? What's that summary proceeding? Exactly, right. The summary proceeding is exactly that. It's a proceeding to get them out fairly quickly. And now, do so they say in the opinion how long it takes under Minnesota law to do the summer proceeding? Yeah, so, so the book, I think, says three to ten days in Minnesota. I'll get to the Texas one in a little bit. Okay? So the law recognizes that often you need to have turnover in an apartment. If you have a, if you have a, a new tenant wants to move in, you shouldn't have to wait for all this time. So they have ways to get this done fairly quickly. Um, interestingly enough, the book calls this kind of like the minority rule, but um, the modern rule is effectively the majority rule. Um, they list at least 16 states, among one of which is Texas, California, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Louisiana, Nebraska, Louisiana, Maine, next, North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Washington. Right? In almost all states, you can't resort to self-help anymore. That might surprise you. And if any of you had landlords who tried to do some self-help, they probably were in violation of the law. If a landlord wants to deal with the tenant, they must do so through the law. They must do so through the courts. Okay? Failing to resort to uh, judicial remedies results in a violation of the law. Okay, here's the, um, here's actually uh, the, the Texas uh, uh, statute here. Um, you get, it's linked as well. Uh, but forcible entry is against the law in Texas, right? So a forcible entry is defined very broadly. An entry without the consent of the person in possession, okay? Also an entry without the consent of a tenant at will. 
So even if you are a tenant who's holding over, right, you didn't pay your rent, the landlord can't just enter, change the locks, and throw you out. They have to take various steps. So this is here section 24005, uh, which gives a notice, right? And this part says here that at least three days written notice is required before you file a detainer suit. So before they move to evict you in Texas, they have to give you three days written notice. That's not very long. Other states, it's a month or two months. But you have to have three days written notice. Okay? Uh, I also I looked up the numbers, and there's this website, and I, I don't, I can't really vouch for it, but it looks, I don't know, it looks pretty comprehensive, and if anyone tells me I'm wrong, I could, I can, you can correct me. But it says that the entire process for eviction in, in, uh, in Harris County takes uh, roughly 20 to 23 days. Um, and it goes like this. So you have the three days by statute to give notice, okay? Then you have eight to 10 days if to serve the citation, okay? In other words, you need to actually formally serve them. You can't just like mail them, whatever. That's what the formal service the process. Then there's a hearing, okay? Then you have five days to appeal the suit following the hearing. So you're required to appeal in five days. You can't let this sit, okay? And then, assuming that the appeal doesn't go anywhere, then you have two days. Uh, the constable has to post a 24-hour uh, vacate notice, and then they then they'll seize the property. So we're looking at roughly three weeks to a month just to evict someone. Anyone ever want to talk about this? Have experience with this? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Wow. Did he, did he run away? Where did he go? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what happened. I mean, when the council, that's actually a good Fourth Amendment question. When the council found the marijuana, did you have to prosecute him? You know, I was in the middle of my first Can you find out? Because that's actually a good Fourth Amendment question. If the, if the police enter based on a rate of seizure for uh, evicting someone, uh, I'm assuming they can also keep the pot and prosecute them. You know about this, Raymond? Yeah, it's so. There, there are things. So, have you studied the Fourth Amendment yet? So, this usually requires a search warrant, the Fourth Amendment to search. But there's also something called an administrative search warrant, which is effectively a warrant for some other administrative purpose, to do like an inspection for like safety or whatever. And generally, if the police find something during an administrative search, they can keep it. But if you can find that, I'd be, I'd be curious. Someone else raise a hand. I saw. Anyone else? Yes, sir. JP is just the piece, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these aren't meant to be lengthy proceedings. Yeah, th this is meant to be very quick. It's meant to be a summary proceeding. Um, uh, I think I think Raymond mentioned that usually you don't have lawyers. The landlord is just a lawyer, though, right? And it's interesting. I think I read that the landlord usually wins 50% more than the uh, tenant does. Because, I mean, as a practical matter, it's probably the case the tenant didn't pay the rent, right? Landlords aren't usually going to go trying to evict someone unless they mess up. It probably happens. But most of the time, they didn't pay rent. But also, if you don't have a lawyer, you don't know how to go around. Okay, I mean, do you have more? Any thoughts? Yeah. Right. So this, this is one of those issues where... But Texas is pretty, pretty fast. You read the, the textbook in D.C., the District of Columbia, uh, takes an average of 114 days to evict someone. That's as long. Uh, in New York, you're required to give not three days notice, but 30 days notice, at which point it takes six months to evict. Um, uh, another one, Massachusetts, can take up to two years to evict someone. Um, I know people like consumer protection laws. You like to make it hard to evict, but when you add this kind of uncertainty, landlords have to factor into the rent. Okay, and there's another issue too, right? If uh, what was I have to? I did. Oh yes, yes, ma'am. So, so Natalia, in the olden days, right? If a landlord wanted, I'll, I'll use this example. If a landlord wanted to evict someone and throw a crap on the street, would there be any kind of permanent record of that? Okay. If a landlord now goes through a formal proceeding where they have to call the courts, they call the constable, is there any kind of permanent record about that? Has that affected the person? 
Well, I mean, what 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 do we call permanent records? I was talking about like you know your school report. Sorry. So whenever you go for an apartment, you do a background check, right? And a credit check. Everyone's done that before. You can be damn sure that if you were ever involved in any eviction proceeding or any kind of judicial action against you, that's going to flag. And it's going to be really tough for you to get a, a lease after that. I remember once um, I applied for an apartment, um, and I made a mistake. Instead of writing Joshua, I just wrote Josh because I wasn't paying attention to the application. They ran a search, and they actually flagged someone, and they said, your application was denied. I was like, what do you mean it's denied? I was like, well, you've been convicted of a felony. I'm like, what? And apparently there was some other Josh Blackman in Kentucky who had actually committed a felony, and so I didn't put my full name. But, you know, if you do some bad stuff, you can't rent the apartment. I was, I was actually living. I was like, no, 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 this is wrong. But, yeah, I put my short name. I should always oh, my full name. Um, yeah, so, so there, there is a serious cost to this because now it becomes difficult. And to use your example, if you had just tossed a guy in the street, I don't think you would care much about marijuana. If you would have sold it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you could have made it for the back rent. I mean, you're, under the common law, you were allowed to sell the chattels inside the property to, to compensate for the lost rent. I don't know where should marijuana. Was was it like was it like a like a greenhouse aside or something or? Good for you. Yeah, good for you, right? Anyway, so there are some costs in this, but we should know now that self help is not legal. You can't do it. If you have a problem with the tenant, you have to go to the court. Yeah. Uh, the summary of proceedings are meant to expedite things, but they're not always as fast as we like. Okay. Yes. Just about. Um, and, and there's another issue. What is reasonable self-help, right? So in the olden days, I think anything short of beating the crap out of the guy would be reasonable, right? But now, well, let me ask you also. Was changing the lock considered reasonable? No, did the court say that was reasonable though? Right. So. You think that changing the lots, which is something that there's no physical altercation, right? You're physically changing the lots, that's not reasonable. If changing the lots is not reasonable, I'm really hard pressed to think of anything that would be reasonable. Right? Because you can imagine, you know, if you see someone change your locks, you're gonna try and stop them physically. Right? If you ever seen someone get into car toads, that's fun. You don't no. ever see that? They carry guns, right? The tow truck drivers, they are packing, so don't mess with them. I remember I was once in Virginia, there was like this uh, uh, facility I worked at, and they would always tow within two seconds. And this guy, I swear, he actually got into the cars to be towed away. And another guy was like saying, stop, stop, stop. And the guy was like, dude, don't. So, a show like called Tow Wars or something? Or, yeah. So, if you see someone changing your locks, you're going to get aggressive and belligerent. It's people just have a very short fuse for those guys. So, so to answer your question, a question, Melissa, effective today, you can't really do anything to self help. I mean, even if states have these laws in the books that allow it, anything you do will be considered unreasonable force. So, effectively, you can't. Yay, landlord. Yes. You asked my common law. Yes, 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 and that's why that's why Texas has the statute. This um, what's it called? The uh, forceful entry and detainer, right? States still have these laws in the book. So even if a landlord was using self-help and did so in a violent manner, even at common law they can be prosecuted, right? At common law, it was okay to change locks. That wasn't a big deal. It was okay to go in, take all the crap, throw it on the street, and change the locks. But you couldn't physically, like, pick up a person and throw them on the street. You weren't allowed to do that. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, so you're asking about like in Massachusetts or New York? How do I put this? The courts are very much in favor of the tenants, right? And by delaying the proceedings and stretching things out, you allow a person to stay in their home. And some judges are very much inclined to want that to happen. Yeah. The statute, I mean, the statute in New York says you have 30 days notice, right? That's actually in the statute. But beyond that, the courts have various procedures how long it can take. If they don't do things in an expeditious manner, they can stretch things out. They can give appeals. They can they can ask for evidence. They can give things to the person in their apartment. Um, 
One interesting other note that the book mentioned is that for, for, for living in government housing, either federal or state uh, subsidized housing, do you know about this, Raymond? That's right. The 14th Amendment, the 5th Amendment, which guarantees rights of due process for property <laughs> interests. Having a government uh, subsidized apartment in Section 8, for example, is considered a property interest. Before the government can take it away from you, they actually have to give you a hearing. And I'm not talking about a justice of the peace. You actually have a full-out hearing. We have to address your grievances. So it's extremely hard to evict someone from a Section 8 housing. Uh, it, it, it's very tough. Um, a a fu funny story my grandma always told. So after my, uh, gran my, my, my grandpa served in World War II, and after he got back, um, they moved to some sort of government ha subsidized housing somewhere in actually uh, bed Stuy, which is now like not not the best, you know, not this area, but back then it was not, not that good. Oh, anyway, so they moved to this they moved to this apartment in bed Stuy. It's actually where I think Jay Z grew up, um, and they're living in this housing. It was fine, but my grandma hated it. She didn't want to live there anymore. And my grandpa actually got a better job, and he actually went above the income threshold to live there. And my grandma wanted to get rid of it, so she actually told the landlord, "Hey, you know, we're making too much money now." Because she did that intention, she wanted to move out, and they kicked him out. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was the story of how my parents, grandparents moved out of that place. Anyway. <laughs> Funny. All right, so let's go to Jersey, okay? So, so from bedside of Jersey. Uh, this is actually, oops, wrong one. This is actually the building, that, what's it called, the, the Pierre? <laughs> This is actually the building uh, in, in Hackensack, New Jersey that we're talking about. I, I will mute this here. I'll, I'll let this play in the background. This is what a, a luxurious apartment in the Pierre looks like. Look, look, how, look how awesome this is. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that nice? Wow, yeah. Anyway, so actually the, the facts here are kind of funny. This is the reason why lawyers should never prosecute their own cases, right? This is why lawyers should never represent themselves because they're really dumb things. Okay. The plaintiff in this case, actually, let's do the facts. Um, uh, Lillian, you're up. Um, oh, poor law students, right? <laughs> Yeah, okay, that, that's good. So again, this is the case where lawyers should never prosecute their own case, right? So what happened here? Uh, the plaintiff enters into a lease for roughly two years to rent, okay? He puts down the first month rent, which is what, $345. He puts down a security deposit for the, same, for the same amount, okay? He was expected to move in around May 1st, okay? But then, tragically, the plans changed. His engagement broke up. His wife left him. I'm guessing his wife's parents, or I guess his wife to be's parents left him, because they were going to pay for the apartment, right? To get the newly, newlyweds a, a love nest, right? Didn't happen. So he writes this very sad, sad email. Or not email. He writes this very sad letter to Lama saying, "Please, I'm a law student." I, oh, by the way, do, do people do you acknowledge that you're a lawyer, a law student, when you send these kinds of things? I wouldn't. I think it makes things worse. I usually don't tell people I'm a lawyer because people get very agitated and they start getting a little nervous. I usually don't mention that. I, you're, you're free to say you're a law student. It doesn't really say much. Uh, but I usually... <laughs> you can't do anything. You can't do anything. You're not lawyers yet. You will be soon. But I usually don't mention I'm a lawyer because I think it agitates because people like... Whenever I say I'm a lawyer, it's like, oh, you know, they're hiding. So I, if you're over sympathy, don't mention that. Okay, don't put like a legal stationary with it. Just don't do it. But... I struggle with that. I don't really like professor. I usually say I used to say teacher, but then they ask like what grade. So I, I, say, <laughs> I say professor. I say I teach the South Texas College of Law. That's a little bit more unclear. I actually, actually I work at South Texas College of Law. I use that sometimes too. But anyway. I'm in education. Actually, funny story. So Justice Stevens on the Supreme Court, he was very humble. So whenever anyone asked him what do you do, he said, I'm a government lawyer. Supreme Court Justice said, I'm a government lawyer. I like that. That's good. So he sends a sad letter saying, oh, you know, I can't, I can't come. Keep your first month rent. Keep your security deposit. I didn't have a key yet, so I came and surrender a key, and let's just call this a day, right? Okay, uh, 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 Haley, did they call this a day? What, what do they do?
Yeah. So th this this landlord's a jerk, right? He's a jerk. There's two full years left on this lease. Instead of letting someone else come in, and there was someone else who express interest, he says no. Hey, why in the world would he expect this poor kid who just got the engagement program to pay for it instead of someone else would actually, you know, actually pay for it? Why would he want to put all this on that kid? Right. No, I know that he said that, but from a business perspective, what's better? A slight chance of recovering that money or a guarantee of getting it from some new title? Which would be a better business decision? Yeah. So from a business perspective, the landlord should have taken the new guy's money. There, there's no question about that. But instead, he decided to go after it. Is your hand up or you just... They'd rather have an empty apartment where they're possibly getting leases maybe like 5%, right? Versus a guarantee getting money? No, they Yeah, I mean, does anyone have any reasons why the landlord would do this? I mean, I'm sure you can think of a reason. He hates law students, so this was just a screw of the law students, huh? Maybe. Yeah. Well, let me ask this question. Under the law that existed at the time, right, what was the duty? When he made this decision, what was the law at the time in New Jersey? No? Um, actually, so, is your hand up? Oh. And double dipping is not the right phrase, it's not for each unit, right? So it would be earning two rents for each unit to be earning one rent for each tenant. Yeah. So I could burn the hand for the, the two tenant push. Yeah. What do you mean? Are you saying that he had another apartment? Perhaps. That, that, that's what he said. He had several units. I mean, look at this building. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a gorgeous structure. I mean, this is just... This is a, you know, it's a very tall building. I mean, there are a lot of units. Okay. So, Ashley, so in this case, and this question asks for, what was the law at the time of this decision? Who do you, did you have any duty to mitigate? Okay. So, so this is the difficulty. Whenever a court, and if you know, it's always New Jersey or California, whenever a court changes the common law, right? Because you have lots of landlords and lots of property owners who make decisions based on what the law says. So imagine you're this guy's lawyer, right? He comes to you and says, hey, you know, I have a decision to make. Am I going to have any duty to mitigate? And the lawyer's like, no, you're good. Do whatever you want, right? That's exactly what the lawyer would have said. Okay, he did what the lawyer said. But now they go and have to go change the law on him, all right? So there was actually the companion case. Um, uh, Chris, Chris, actually, oh, wait, I always skipped you. Play. What, what did the companion case say, uh, the, the, uh, the Riverview reality case? You got it? Yeah, um, what, what were the facts there? Okay. How long was he there for? Yeah, okay. So so facts were signs a two year lease, he's there for one year and he's and he leaves, right? And and the issue is effectively the same. Does the landlord have any duty to mitigate? Okay? The facts are a little bit different from the first case. The second case, the first one, in the record, there was interest from someone else. In this case, there's nothing in the record to show there's any interest from someone else, right? So, Don, what does the uh, what does the court do here? How do they consider uh, the duty to mitigate?
All right, explain. So, drop that wall on. If you're selling, say, a thousand tickets, and someone buys, I don't know, a breach of contract is in the bank, but yet you still have to sell it. It's supposed to look at it as, you know, you could have been, instead of getting, it's not that, even if you put that thing with it, you still. Okay, good. So, Christopher, how do they rationalize though importing contract out from the property? Why do they? Why do they do this? How, why is it similar? The court basically says that this is about fairness, about equity, about justice, right? The reason why they're importing contract doctrine is not that maybe it's better or right, expected, but it's more fair. And more precisely, who is it fair to? It's fair to the tenant, right? Uh, let's see. Matthew, how does this how does this shake out then for the uh, landlord? How does the landlord like this have an opinion? I would assume they don't like it. Why not? Well, I mean, <clears throat> that's something I think I was saying earlier, something different than the money. And then also, they now have the burden of trying to find somebody else to replace what they already had sold. Good. So um, let's see, uh, Jeremy, what what exactly is this duty to mitigate contained? What are what are now the landlords required to do? Realistic, uh, reasonable measures to find a new tenant. And what are some of these measures? Uh, they list a bunch of them. <laughs> Right. You got to put an ad in the newspaper. You have to you have to basically take steps to show the property to other people, right? You have to you have to firmly do stuff to create the possibility that someone else might rent it. Okay. And there's also the fact, Raymond, of how long they waited. I mean this guy's sitting there for fifteen months letting all this all this rent pile up. Do you think the time period that you wait might be a factor? Uh, yeah, I mean I think with the Okay, now another question, Anthony. How do you know when the tenants actually moved out? Let's look back at the Minnesota case we did a few minutes before, where she put up the you know the renovation sign, but it wasn't clear if she actually moved out. In the absence of any kind of letter like this, when does the landlord's duty to mitigate kick in? Um I guess if they removed all their stuff, and, and I guess based on the intention, they would leave them. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, does the does the tenant get off scot free here? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. George. <laughs> sorry. George, does the tenant get off scot free here? Because it seems like the tenant's getting a pretty good deal here. He walked away from lease. Does he have to pay anything? No, I mean that's why they go to court. And yes, that's why it has to be fair. A little bit. Right, but but what did the court do? Did the, did the court assess anything? For the tenant, does it does it does the tenant have any liability here? Well, tenant's not exactly part of the lease. What what did the tenant lose? What did the tenant lose? Yeah. What what did the tenant lose here? Well, I don't know what. Well, so what did the tenant lose? Well, so what did the tenant lose? Didn't he not? Was he not able to recover the rent that he already paid out? That's all he lost. He lost the first month rent. He lost his security deposit. So we're talking about instead of several thousand dollars, all he lost was like nine hundred, right? Is this fair that the tenant gets off scot free? So what what would the better remedy be here? I mean, they would have to pay some sort of fine, or I guess yeah. Well, I think I mean I think it's fair because. Tenant has now had this, as we talked about earlier, permanent effect of the incident. He's not going to be able to find probably what place to lease to him. So, this little fine that he's paid for the plus rent, plus the not being able to lease again. Let me ask this question. What if it takes the landlord three months to rent out the property, right? Would it be fair to hold the tenant accountable for the rent for those three months? Well, 
I, I was in a, a, a lease of an apartment and I broke my lease like way early. And um, <laughs> like I didn't use the I just moved in my stuff, but then I broke my lease. And so basically this case. Basically. So were you a law student? Yeah, I was a law student. <laughs> so this is your story. Okay, yeah. what, what happened? Um, so I was charged for the rent, like full amount of rent, until they were able to pay a new um, lessee. And it took them um, three months. So that was the exact hypo I just gave him? Yeah. Wow. Fair points. <laughs> right. So the general rule is. Becky? I was going to say a lot of times in the lease provision, the percentage. Okay. How, how did that work? For each yeah. month, you pay a percentage? Each month, yeah. You're breaking the lease for a 12 month lease, and you're going to still have that. You're breaking the lease. Right. 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 So it's not the case that the tenant gets off scot free, right? The tenants can be on the hook to pay whatever rent until the apartment is is relent. So it takes three months in the case of Melissa said. It's only for three months. What happens, Jared, if it, if you're trying for 15 months and they can't rent the damn thing? Is it let is the tenant look for the entire thing? Well, that's a, they show a reasonable diligence. Yeah. yeah. So you can actually imagine a circumstance where, say, this part was in the middle of nowhere, right? Can't rent it. You're on the hook for the entire thing. Now, I think Jackie's right. Most leases that you sign will actually have provisions governing this. I remember once I told you I had an acceleration clause, which I mentioned. Which these, are, these are brutal. Which this is a two year lease, right? If I breach at month three, I would have to immediately pay the remaining 21 months' rent. Immediately. Right, so effectively the lease is gone. They can. It doesn't matter how long it takes them to rent to someone else. Um, you also have percentages, but what this case does is it imposes it as a matter of law. So regardless of what your contract said, what your lease said, <laughs> you still have this duty to mitigate. Right. Let's see, Latarsha. Let me ask you this question: What happens if, say, <laughs> Melissa was paying a thousand dollars rent, right, and the person who came in afterwards can only paid eight hundred? That's the best rental they can get. <laughs> Yeah. So in some cases, if her rent was a thousand a month and the second rent was only eight hundred, the courts will actually impose on her the cost of the difference. Right? The idea is to try to make everything effective to the status quo. By breaching the lease early, you mess up. Right? You no offense, but you, you, you mess up. You breach the lease. And you should not be able to walk away scot free. But under this modern trend, courts will solve her, I'm sorry, the landlord has a responsibility to try and find someone for that lease. Yeah. Now, uh, Will, what if, what, if, what if, say, uh, Melissa's rent was 1000 and then a new guy comes in and pays 1200 months? What happens then? I'd like to make Yeah, no, she won't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, at that point, they probably let it go. Uh, I, I think that would be almost unjust and rich for it to actually profit from her breach. Yes. No, that's probably not going to happen, okay? Um, and this is actually the majority rule. It's in 42 states, NDC, Texas among them, that landlords have this duty to mitigate. Okay? Um, it's an open question if this applies to commercial versus residential. Um, this is mentioned in the book, but usually you have kind of different sets of laws applying to commercial properties and residential. And the reason why is you assume people in commercial properties are more sophisticated. This is why, you remember, uh, in contracts you have the UCC provisions for merchants. Remember, like, you have different rules for merchants? You're black with that already. But the reason why is assume that merchants have certain knowledge. So these duties to mitigate probably don't always apply uh, uh, at various residential, I'm sorry, various commercial enterprises, but for residential they will. Okay? All right. I'm sorry? Absolutely. Usually commercial leases for a longer period have equipment, facilities, and stuff. Karen? Um, well, in this particular case, I mean, another one fair applicable the landlord acted lawfully. So I mean then we change the law after this injury or after this conflict this dispute. It would seem like and why you don't follow the law if they're gonna make you just change it up I guess case by case scenario. I know it happens. It, it's a Jersey general. thing. Yeah. No and I'm not, not being facetious but yeah. Jersey and California, this Supreme Court's are notorious for changing the common law. And they do it in a retroactive fashion. So you're effectively holding people to account for law that's different. 
So had this guy gone to his lawyer when this happened and said, hey, lawyer, what do I do here, right? The lawyer would say, yeah, no duty to mitigate, you're fine. But by imposing this duty after the fact, they're rendering legal advice null. Um, it's probably very tough to be a lawyer in these states for that reason. Raymond? That's all in the civil law, not criminal law. So in criminal law, you have the ex post facto doctrine, which says that you can't be punished for something that becomes illegal afterwards. So if something's legal today and tomorrow's criminalized, you can't be punished for that. That's the Constitution. Okay. Questions? Okay, enjoy your early, early weekend.